told you we'd talk about hockey. I have never been a hockey fan until recently. If I had a thousand dollars in a catfish, I'd be there tonight. <laughs> I kind of thought about throwing a catfish out in the crowd today just to see what happens. <laughs> no doubt. And um, I am fascinated with Pekka Rene. I'm fascinated with how good he can be and how bad he can be. A poor guy, he loves Nashville, doesn't he? And he's not too fond of Pittsburgh. And uh, we have seen in this series, if you kept up with it, that when he's on, Nashville's unstoppable. And when he's not on, we don't have a chance. Three goals in the first... Who would have ever thought that Pekka Rene would be pulled from the game in the first period in the last game up in Pittsburgh? And we're reminded how important an individual can be to the success of a team. This is not a new thing. We've seen this in baseball. We certainly see it with the success of a quarterback in football. I worked at Disney several years ago. I was a trumpet player there. And we had to go through intensive training because Disney spends billions of dollars a year to make sure that place is beautiful, to make sure the rides are attractive. They have people called Imagineers that try to make sure that your experience is as incredible as possible. But Disney knows that all it takes is one careless bus driver to wreck a bus that you're riding in and the experience won't be too good. They know that all it takes is one food worker who doesn't take care to make sure that your chicken is cooked correctly to make sure that your experience is not good. They know that one person who's having a bad day, who's wearing a Disney uniform, can say something to you that would ruin the entire experience that they've spent billions of dollars for you to have. And so Disney knows that everything comes down to that individual employee making sure they do the best job. Let me just extend the illustration a little bit more. I've been to Gettysburg. Anybody ever been to Gettysburg before? Gettysburg's in a fascinating, fascinating experience. And there's a hill called Little Round Top. And there the defenders were spread thin and they repulsed attackers by the hundreds. And if just one man would have failed in his duty. If just one man would have allowed that line to be penetrated, Gettysburg would have gone a different way. And the fight for our nation would have gone a different way. All coming down to the responsibility of one individual, an entire army, an entire nation relying on just one. Let me take this a step further. This is how the church also works. The Bible relates the church to a body. How many of you know that if your appendix isn't working quite right, you can tell it? Anybody here ever had a kidney stone like me? Oh, I've told you about this before. It is, that's the worst pain I've ever had. And I, I can remember that, that when that kidney stone comes on, it doesn't matter how the rest of your body's working. You are not going to function. Just ask Kenny Vedito. He'll tell you. How many of you know that if your heart fails, it doesn't matter how healthy your kidneys are? The Bible says we are, we are one body made up of many parts. And, 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 and what good is it if the body has a part that's not going to work? The Bible also relates us as a building. And you know, if you take out the cornerstone of the building, you take out a, an important keystone in the building, you know that the building will crumble. Are you getting the point? The church isn't some sort of organization. The church is not a place. The church isn't a club or society. The church is made up of people. And the success or failure of the church rises on the success or failure of God's people. And so the church isn't defined by the name on the sign. It's not defined by a man in the pulpit. I've heard people from a local church talking about their pastor who had gone. And the new pastor comes in, and they just don't attend as much anymore because it's just not the same. And I 
I want to say to them, what a terrible, what a terrible memorial to a legacy to leave church or not attend or not serve because it's not your style anymore. Church isn't defined by the pastor. It's not defined by the shape or the location. It's not, it doesn't succeed based upon its marketing or its strategy or its location. The Bible tells us that Jesus says of his church, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Just this week we see in China a church demolished, its people dragged out of the church and beaten in the middle of the street. I'm going to tell you that the Communist Party in China cannot defeat the church as long as its members are faithful. Amen? And so let me just say this. The church, just like a hockey team, just like Disney World, just like a battle line, rises or falls based upon how you do your job. As a matter of fact, I just want you to think about that word church for a moment. You can see the word on your bulletin. Goodlitzville Church, and look right in the middle of that word church, C-H-U-R-C-H. At the heart of the church, what is the heart of the church? You are. Just think about it with me. You are the heart of the church, and the success of the church rises or falls based upon how you do your job. Mm. Where are the Facebook posts about that? How many of you see hundreds of Facebook posts about what the church is doing wrong? How your church is failing? Here's all the problems with the church. I've even seen churches that have signs, this is a church for people that hate church. I have never seen one of those churches ultimately succeed because eventually they become the thing that they hate. The problem with the church isn't that we don't have a prescription for a cool strategy. That we don't have a way to measure trends. That we're not hip or relevant. The problem with the church is that people have failed to take up their responsibility of carrying the banner, of filling in on their spot in the line, of being faithful to do their part. And so we become a church that tries to attract people. We try to attract people by being relevant or hip or cool. We try to do things that people would want to come to. In other words, we try to market to people's tastes. And what we've created are millions of believers who are not filling their responsibility in the kingdom of God. You know, we talk about the need for revival, and I believe the church needs revival, but revival doesn't happen in a series of meetings. Revival happens when God knocks on the door of your heart and you change. I pray that today would be a day of revival. Now, in the Bible, there's no prescription to stay relevant or cool. There's no way to measure trends laid out in the Bible, no way to stay hip or relevant, but there are thousands of instructions to each individual member of the church, to this church, and a clear warning that just like hockey, just like the military, just like your place of business, that the church is only as strong as its weakest link. Would you say that with me? The church is only as strong as its weakest link. This is no more ever spelled out than it is in the story of Ananias and Sapphira that Ken read earlier. But the story of Ananias and Sapphira really doesn't begin in Acts chapter 5. It begins in Acts chapter 4. You see, in Acts chapter 4, everything is going great. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church. People are excited. They've had a revelation of the risen Christ. They've realized what he's done for them, and they are giving their all. As a matter of fact, Acts chapter 4 ends with a man named Barnabas. Ever hear of Barnabas before? Barnabas comes, and he loves the church. And all these people are gathered together, and there has to be some way to continue the work of the church. And so what does Barnabas do? He sells a field and gives all the money to the church. And why is that? So the people can be fed, so the work can go forward, that, that the ones who are preaching can have the supplies that they need to go out and spread the gospel. He sells it and gives it all. And people were amazed, and a lot of people started doing exactly the same thing. This is a picture of what the church is supposed to be like, Acts chapter 4. Everybody doing their part, giving their all, like that man on the line of Little Big Top, to, to, to sacrifice everything to make sure they do their part for the kingdom of God. And then we pick up the story of Ananias and Sapphira, 
in Acts chapter 5, and it's a sad story, as Ken read to you. It's a sad story. Great power, great grace were following the apostles. People's lives were being changed. Thousands were coming to faith in Christ. That would make a good Facebook post, wouldn't it? Hear the gospel, spread the gospel, give all for the gospel, and that's what makes the church. And so here are two members of this group, Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They also had sold a field. And part of the profit from the sale they kept back for themselves. That was totally acceptable. They didn't have to sell the field. There was nothing, nothing pressing them, nothing to say you have to sell the field to be a part of the church. We know that you don't become a part of the church by what you give. We know that you become a church because of what Jesus Christ gave. Amen. We know that we are made part of this body through what he gave, and that is his life. We talked about it earlier. Through him, we have forgiveness of sins. Through him, we belong to the body of Christ. We are adopted in. We are made part. And so these people sold the field, but they kept back part of it, except that they lied. They brought the prophets from the field, and they gave it to the apostles, and they said, this is all. And you can see immediately the hypocrisy in what they did. It should trouble your spirit. It should should bother you. You should say, I don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira. And so they laid the money at the apostles' feet, and Ananias made a pretense of having given all the proceeds. This hypocritical show may have fooled some. And by the way, we never know who's a hypocrite in our church. We never know who's a hypocrite in the church at large. But we do know that right here, God certainly knows. He may have fooled some, but he didn't fool Peter. You see, Peter was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter knew instantly that Ananias was lying. Not just lying to him, but lying to God, God's Holy Spirit. And he exposed this hypocrisy then and there. Ananias, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 4, Ananias fell down dead. How many of you are glad that God doesn't keep doing that in the church today? Aren't you glad that God doesn't strike hypocrites down today? Now listen, this is not the Old Testament. This isn't Exodus or Leviticus. This is the New Testament. This is the book of Acts. This is the church of Christ. And this is God demonstrating then and there, this is how serious I am about my church. Right then and there, he shows to the entire church how serious he is about the purity of the church, how serious he is that the church not be filled with hypocrites. And so even though God doesn't continue to strike people down dead in the church today, he has certainly showed us how serious he takes it. Sapphira shows up. She too lied. And then you saw how Peter pronounced the judgment upon her, she died. And it says, great fear came upon the entire church. I imagine that is an understatement, don't you? (laughs) Two hypocrites exposed, and there on the spot, they die. Wow. But the question is, why? Why, in this New Testament church, where we are saved through Christ, and Christ alone, faith in Him alone, where we're saved, not based upon our works, not because of what we give. Why in this New Testament church do we see two people who are killed for lying? Well, God's reasons for bringing about the death of Ananias and Sapphira involve his abhorrence of sin. As a matter of fact, that's a great word. Don't you like the word abhor? Just say it, abhor. And get real fancy, say abhorrence. God has an abhorrence for sin. You know what? There's some things I have an abhorrence for. Snakes. How many of you have an abhorrence of snakes? Throw a fake spider on Angie Mills and see what she abhors. All right? Anybody abhor spinach? Not my favorite, right? And and I'm not really crazy about fruit. I don't abhor it. There are certain things that I abhor. I'm not really, I don't really like body odor too much. How about you? All right? Here we see that God abhors sin. Like a person who's frightened of a snake, he goes, get away from me. He hates the sin and he hates the hypocrisy of the couple. And the lesson for the rest of the church, both then and there, then and now, is God abhors sin 
and he hates hypocrisy. And so it can be easy today to gloss over the, the holiness of God. It can be easy today to come to church and say, oh, it's all about you. Here's what God wants to do for you. Here's how you can have a better life and miss God's heart. God would that his people be holy. This has never changed. In the Vigitus, he says, be ye holy as I, the Lord, am holy. And so were Ananias and Sapphira saved? Yes, probably so. This is in context of the actions of all believers, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. They knew of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 5, verse 3. And Ananias' lie could have been an earlier promise that he would give the whole amount of the sale to the Lord. But the best evidence that they were the children of God may be the fact that they received discipline. The Bible says if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Hebrews 12, 8. Ananias and his wife had conspired to garner the accolades of the church, but their conspiracy led to sin and death. And so there's a question for me and you today. Are we weak links in the church? Are we like Ananias and Sapphira? There's three things that I just want to point out in this passage today. Number one, the seriousness of sin. Will you say that with me? The seriousness of sin. Oh, I'd rather preach about God's love. I really would. I love the fact that God loves us. But when we see God's love, we see Jesus Christ. When we see Jesus Christ, we see the wrath of God poured out so that the love of God could be fulfilled. We see God's hatred of sin, how serious he is about sin. God didn't just say, oh, you can be forgiven. Jesus doesn't have to die. Do you think he wanted to see his children die? I love my kids. The thoughts of giving my kids for you, I, I couldn't handle it. Of seeing them suffer for you, I don't know that I could do that. But God did. And the reason is because he takes sin seriously. The case of Ananias and Sapphira illustrates the fact that even believers can be led into bold and flagrant sin. Listen to me again, church. Believers can sin. How many of you know that to be true? And I know that to be true of myself. And we do not need to gloss over the sin. Because if believers sin, the church cannot succeed. And God loves his church. Jesus Christ is coming back not to receive a bunch of glorified individuals, but his church. And we all have a part to play to make sure the church is everything that it needs to be. And so we see that in the church, we see here, God hates sin. He is serious about sin. You see, it was Satan that had filled their hearts. That's what it says in 5.3. Why has Satan filled your hearts? And we see that the purpose God allowed this was to test the spirit of the Lord. Covenants, covetousness, hypocrisy, a desire for the praise of men, all played a part of their demise. Let me ask you today, are you here just for show? Are you here just to try to appease God? Maybe Ananias and Sapphira thought, maybe, I will just give a little bit. I mean, heaven's sake, they should be happy to have us. They should be glad to have anything that we give. No. We see here the seriousness of sin. They were covetous. They were hypocrites. They wanted the praise of men rather than to be faithful to God, and it led to their demise. When we come to the part in our service where we say, God, Search my heart and see if there's any evil way in us. That is so serious. Anytime God pricks your heart and says what you're doing is sin, you need to repent then and there because sin is a serious matter. Why is the church failing? Why is the church in decline? Why are we seeing an entire generation grow up not knowing Jesus Christ? Why? It's not because of a strategy. No. It's not because of our location. It's not because of the failures of church leaders. No. It's because the church has tolerated sin. And in Acts chapter 5, we see that God doesn't want sin to be tolerated. The sin of failing our Lord, of holding back, of not giving our all, is serious. The second thing we see in this passage is that God hates hypocrisy. Will you say that with me? God hates hypocrisy. Oh, the world thinks they hate hypocrisy, but they don't. God is the one who hates hypocrisy. 
God is the one who hates somebody who says they're one thing, but he who searches the heart knows the truth that they're something else. You see, here God sees the heart of Ananias and Sapphira, and immediately they are exposed for what they really are. They are not those who would give their all for God. They're liars. There are those who are there for the show. There are those who think maybe they can just simply, simply satisfy a, a little bit of the requirement. The sudden dramatic deaths of Ananias and Sapphira served to purify and warn the church. It says in Acts 5.11 that great fear seized the whole church. Let me say today that fear should not be the primary motivator of the church, but fear should be ever present in the back of our minds. We know that God loves us. He's received us as children. But I'm going to tell you something. At my grandparents' house, my grandma and grandpa Bennett, my grandfather was a man's man. And he loved us with his whole heart. He's the kind of guy that he'd get home in the evening and he'd see his grandchildren and he'd give us a big hug and a big kiss. And you know the kind where there's a five o'clock shadow there and it's a little rough and your face is red after he gives you a hug and kiss? Where he would throw you a quarter, back in that day a quarter would buy an ice cream, and he'd say, buy yourself an ice cream cone. Where he would bring you into the table, he'd sit you on his knee, but I'm going to tell you something. You didn't want to disobey him. He never touched me. He never laid a hand upon me. He never had to. Because I had a healthy fear of him. That's what we should have for the Lord. Here God is saying to the church, you need to respect me, a holy God. Great fear seized the whole church. Right away in the church's infancy, God makes it plain that hypocrisy is not going to be tolerated. His judgment of Ananias and Sapphira helped guard the church against future pretense. In other words, one writer says this, God laid the bodies of Ananias and Sapphira in the path of every hypocrite who would seek to enter the church. Today, let me ask you. I tell you what, pl planning sermons sometimes are painful because I have to deal with this for a week or two at a time. But let me ask you here in this few minutes we're together. Are you a hypocrite? Have you come to the altar of the church and say, I, I will support the church with my time, my talent, my giving, my prayers. I will, I will study to show myself approved unto God, a workman need not be ashamed. I will spread the gospel around the world. I will be committed in loving relationship to my brothers and sisters in Christ and then live a lie. Are you a hypocrite today? Hypocrisy is not what made the church great. Hypocrisy is what killed Ananias and Sapphira. There's a third thing that I want you to see here, and it's this. The apostles' authority. Will you say that with me? The apostles' authority. I'll be preaching here in the fall about leadership in the church, and I'll be talking to you about this, but let me just touch on it today. The apostles were not hirelings of the church. The church didn't pick the apostles. God picked the apostles. Today, we don't pick pastors. We don't pick elders. We see the, simply acknowledge that God has picked them, and we acknowledge that. And, and, and today, we shop around for pastors. We shop around for church leaders, and we go, I like that. I don't like that. And, and if we don't like it, we go somewhere else. And there's no authority over our lives from the hierarchy of the church. That, my friends, is not the way God designed it. He designed that we would be under the apostles' authority through pastors and elders and deacons and, and even on down to Sunday school teachers and, and even those who are older than us in Christ. Are we living under the authority of the apostles? You see, Peter knew right away in the spirit that he was lying. You see, the sinners had fallen dead at Peter's feet. It was Peter who had known the secret sin and had the authority to pronounce judgment, as Matthew 16, 19 tells us. And in the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira, we see the authority of Peter being established. And if he would have allowed it to go on, his authority would have been diminished and damaged. The sad story of Ananias and Sapphira, my friends, is not some obscure incident, again, from the Old Testament. This occurred in the first century church, and it's there for a reason. The story of Ananias and Sapphira are reminders to us today that God sees our hearts as individuals. That he hates sin. And that he's concerned for the purity of his church, 1 Corinthians 11. 
As Jesus told the compromising church in Thyatira, here's what he said, Revelation 2, 23. All the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. How do you know Pecorine didn't do his job? Three goals in the first period. How do you know if you and I are doing our jobs as Christians? Let me just give you ten diagnostic questions. Are you ready? Here's what I want you to do. Get out a pencil or a pen. Get out your cell phones, if you'd like. Type a text to yourself. And I'm going to give you ten questions, and I want you to grade yourself. Be honest. One, if you're pitiful. Ten, if you're rocking. One, if it's not happening at all. Ten, if you're nailing it. And I want you to be honest. Don't be overly hard on yourself, and don't show yourself too much grace. Because God is the one who's going to grade this test. He searches the heart. The question goes like this. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it were like me? And so here's question number one. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. All right, this is the ACT. Here we go. Number one, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it loved like me? A one to ten. Where do you rank on that? What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it loved like me? Number two. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it worshipped like me? What's your worship like? On a scale of one to ten, where do you stand? What kind of church would it be if everyone worshipped like me? Number three. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it attended like me? I'm going to tell you, it's very hard to build a church when people aren't there half the time. When they show up once or twice a year or a third of the time and they say, that's enough. How would you like to build a baseball team with that kind of attendance? How would you like to have employees who attended like that? It would be hard to be successful. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it attended like me? Number four. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it gave like me? God's design is that we would give 10%, and that's just the start. The Bible tells us that we should give our all. We should lay it all down. That we should be like Barnabas's, not like Ananias and Sapphira. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it gave like me? Number five, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it served like me? If everyone in it served like me, were to be his hands, were to be his feet, were to reach out to the poor, to help those who are hurting, to give our service to our world. Number six, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it had the same attitude as me? How many of you know Christians with just bad attitudes? And you say, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be around them. Here at our church, we say that we should give each other the benefit of the doubt, that we should assume best intentions. Is that what you do? Number seven, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it prayed like me? Oh, prayer is so essential to the success of the church. Where's the last Facebook blog that says the problem with the church today is that it doesn't pray? Number eight, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it studied like me? Studied the word of God. The Bible tells us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do we know error when we see it? Are we able to proclaim and lead other people to the light? Do you study? Number nine. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it forgave like me? The Bible tells us to forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. If we don't forgive one another, it says, how can we expect forgiveness? Are you forgiving? Finally, number 10. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in it evangelized like me? Evangelism is inviting people to church, sharing the gospel, reaching out to people with the intention of seeing them come to faith in Christ. 
That is the great commission of the church. And I imagine there's a lot of ones in here today. I'll total those up. A 90 and up is an A. 80 and up is a B. 70 and up is a C. Some of you are getting back to your school days right about here. 60 and up is a D. Anything below is an F. Where do you stand today? Are you the weakest link? There's a great crowd gathered. I don't know if in heaven they throw catfishes on the ice or not. The Bible says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I just want you to hear the cheering of all the saints that have gone on before. Hear the cheering of the ones who died in the arena at Rome saying, you can do it. Hear the words of Barnabas who gave his all saying, you can do it. Hear the words of those massacred in the Middle East in recent months and years saying, you can do it. Hear those who gave property for this church to be built saying, you can do it. Hear the voice of the pastors who have preached here throughout the years saying, you can do it. Hear the voices of your grandmas and your grandpas, of those faithful witnesses that influenced you for Christ, shouting and cheering, waving their banners, saying, you can do it. Tonight, there'll be over 100,000 people gathered downtown. They'll be listening to country music, and they'll be watching hockey. Isn't that weird? And they'll all have their eyes on one guy. No pressure or anything, Pekka Rene. And they'll be praying and hoping with all of their hearts that he does his job. Listen to me, friends. God is watching right now. And his desire for you is that we all do our job. I guarantee you, I promise you this. If you'll do your part, I couldn't mess it up. The elders couldn't mess it up. It wouldn't matter what our strategy was. People would see you and want what you have. And the world would be changed. And so, what kind of church would this church be if everyone in it were like me?